Genesis 1, we have been on the subject for the last uh, couple of Friday nights, the subject of the moving of the Spirit. And so we want to continue tonight. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, why don't you hold up your hand? Our ushers have extra Bibles. Use one of ours. Maybe you got 10 at home, but you didn't bring one. Use one of ours. Turn to Genesis 1. How many read your chapters this week? Let me see. You read your chapters? Okay, good. Now I'm looking in the camera now. Did you read your chapter this week? You in China. Did you read your chapter? Africa. Yeah. Scotland. Did you read your chapter? Everybody that's a part of Faith Life Church reads their chapter every day. Monday through Friday. Now, I'm glad a lot of you raised your hand, but I just know in my spirit, a lot of folk have fallen by the wayside on your Bible reading, and that's not good. It's an indicator of a much bigger problem. It's an indicator that God is not priority in your life like he should be. I know people don't like to think that, oh, well, no, no, I love God much as I ever did. I just ain't got time for that chapter. Mm -mm. It doesn't work that way. If you don't have time for God's Word, you don't have time for Him. People who put God first, they read their Bible. They pray. They go to church. They work in the kingdom. Yeah. Right? Yeah. People who don't have time for these things are kidding themselves that God is first place in their life. Their job is first place in their life. Their family is first place. And listen here, it's a serious thing here now. Anything in your life, job, a profession, family that displaces God, that has a place in your life before God, you're in danger of losing. Because if it takes precedence over God in your life, then um, God, actually legally, he can't protect it like you need him to. I mean, the master key of success in life is seek first. First the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added to you. I know, uh, who was it? Martin Luther, I believe some years ago. He said, I have so many things to do today. I think I should spend the first three hours in prayer. This is a man of understanding. The more you have to do, the more you should pray. But do people do that? No, the more they got to do, then the first thing, they could, if they need more time, they cut out the prayer, they cut out reading the chapter, they cut out going to church, and that's the worst thing that you could do. Because the more you got to do, the more grace you need, the more strength you need, right? The more help you need, the more you are to press into God. The busier you are and the more you got to do, that's more critical it is that you don't fail to read your chapter and go to church, pray, etc., can you say amen? amen? Genesis 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. How did it get here? God created it. So I said, well, you know, emotionally, psychologically weak people need crutches like that to believe. Uh, no, it's just a fact. That's how it happened, right? And the scripture says that fools uh, believe that there is no God and doubt the existence of God. How did the earth get here? What you're sitting on tonight, what this building is built on, uh, God created it. How many believe that with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? God said it. That's how it got here. He made it. Right? Now the reason why people don't like to believe that is because they don't want to be dependent upon Him. And they don't want to have to submit themselves to Him. And if, you know, so they try to believe something else. Now there is no God. Things just happened. You know, there was a big bang. And when it cleared, voila. Voila. <laughs> there was a planet the perfect distance from the sun not too close not too far the atmosphere just right the continents the oceans just right 
Yeah. That's like sitting off a bunch of C4 in the middle of a salvage yard. <laughs> and when the dust clears, you got a brand new Mercedes sitting there. <laughs> now, it takes more faith to believe the theory of evolution than it does creation. <laughs> you got no facts for it. You know why those missing links are missing? <laughs> they ain't just missing. <laughs> they're, they're not there. They don't exist. Anyway, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and we see how it happened. The very next verse, what does it say? Y'all read it for me. The earth was without form and void, empty, and darkness upon the face of the deep. Now, God doesn't create empty, dark things. So we see that even though this is the beginning for us, it's not necessarily the beginning of everything. Because something happened before us. And where did all these spirits come from that are now in darkness? And demons and devils and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, you know, a lot of the answers to uh, where did the dinosaurs come from and and uh, you know, races before us, a lot of that could be answered by what happened before this verse. But it's not something we need to know about. It doesn't apply to us per se. We need to be focusing on what applies to us and our very short run through this planet. Right? So as far as things that pertain to us, this is the beginning for us. And so the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Hallelujah. Everybody say it out loud. The Spirit of God moved. moved. Say it again. The Spirit of God moved. Say it again. The Spirit of God moved. Now notice he says upon the face of the waters. In the scriptures, waters are a types of many peoples. Waters, many waters, a type of peoples, nations, and whole groups of peoples. I believe this literally happened. The Spirit of God moved over the face of the literal waters on the planet. But also, it's typical of today. The Spirit of God, we looked up this word, means hover. He hovers. Over the peoples of the planet. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. He's hovering. And uh, the picture is painted in Jesus talking about, uh, he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I, I would have gathered you like a mother hen gathers her chick, chicks under her wings, but you wouldn't do it. And the spirit of God representing the, the Father God, creator of heaven and earth, and the Lord Jesus, the Word made flesh, He hovers over the peoples of the planet, ready to be the great comforter to anybody that will believe and come to Jesus, ready to take, take you in and teach you and guide you and help you and strengthen you. Can you say Amen. amen. Jesus said, I won't leave you orphans. I will send another comforter to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when he comes, he's going to lead you and guide you into all truth. He's going to bring to your remembrance everything I said to you. He'll even show you things to come. Same Holy Spirit who was hovering over the face of the deep. And what happened next? And God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good, good, 
From the beginning, it's this way. It's been this way all the time up till now. It'll always be this way. The Spirit of God is ready to manifest the power to bring the Word of God to pass in the earth. And when He does, it is always light and it is always good. (laughs) Can you say amen? Amen. Oh, this is shout and grab. We'll have to watch ourselves. We could get happy tonight. This will help you from getting off. Just in my few uh, short years of walking with the Lord, uh, I have seen people get off. In the early days of my ministry, I began to get off a little bit in seeking the supernatural and seeking God and, and the manifestation of the Spirit. Thank God I had a good, strong uh, example in Brother Hagen in my life. And there were times I thought for sure some things was God and a, and a special move of God in the earth. And he, and he taught on it and basically said no. And I thought, huh? I thought we got scripture for it. And it helped me to realize he'd already seen it. He'd already been there. See, a lot of things, just because they're spiritual, that doesn't mean they're God. Did you hear me now? They can be real. And they can be spiritual. But it doesn't mean it's God. And we should not just be hungry for spiritual things. We should not just be hungry for miracles and supernatural. We should be hungry for God. 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 Uh, I have seen people supposedly that pushed and pressed so far into the things of God and they got dark. Did you hear me? Dark. There was a darkness about them and always this, this super secrecy and always this, you know, we're beyond everybody else. And see, that's the nature of the devil. Pride. That's what got him into trouble. No, you're not the only one who knows God. You're not the only one who knows the Spirit of God or the Word of God, right? And uh, that darkness, and you can tell when when you're so so intense and the joy is not there and the peace is not there. It may be spiritual, but it's not God. Because when it's God, it's inseparable from the Word of God, right? And when it's God and the Word of God, it's going to be light. And it's going to be good. And there's going to be peace with it. And there's going to be joy with it. And there's going to be strength. I mean, the very fruit, the very nature of the Spirit of God manifested through the human spirit. What is it? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. See, not not ill-tempered, short-tempered. Long-suffering, gentleness, not harshness, not hardness, gentleness, goodness, meekness, not pride, temperance, self-control, not out of control, faith, and faithfulness. Can you say amen? amen? Knowing the nature of the Spirit of God will help you to stay on and not get off. When it's said out loud with me, when it's the Spirit of God... It's the Word of God. It's It's light. light. And it's good. good. See, the Holy Ghost is not a dark spirit. And uh, I don't care if you just got born again two weeks ago. I don't care if you've only been speaking in tongues for a half a day. Do not let somebody come along that's supposed to know more about God than you. And you ignore what you get on the inside. Did you hear me now? I don't, maybe you are a baby. That may be true. But if something bothers you and you don't feel comfortable with it, don't just ignore what you get on the inside and follow somebody blindly because they said they're a prophet or a prophetess or an apostle or a pastor or whatever. Right? Because in this day and age, you know, in the, in the Old Testament, they'd go to inquire of the Lord. Because they, they didn't have the Holy Ghost, the average man or woman. So they'd go to the prophet and inquire of the Lord. You tell me what the Lord's saying. 
But the Bible says in that day, talking about the day in which we live, they'll not say every man do his brother know the Lord. He said, for they'll all know me from the least to the greatest. Oh, yeah. So nowadays, every child of God has the glorious Spirit of the Lord inside us. And if it's God in somebody else, we should have the witness inside ourselves. Why? Same Spirit. Same Spirit. Same Spirit in you that's in me, that's in any true believer, true minister, true ministry. Do not ignore what you have inside. And let some man or woman lead you. Are you with me now? So we talked about last week. about We took the time to go over to 1 Corinthians. uh, And how that even among prophets. It must be judged. Right? Everything must be. Every sermon ought to be judged. That's one reason you ought to have your Bible out there. Right? One reason you ought to read your chapter every day too. Because over a period of time, you're going to be familiar with the body of the Word. If you do that every day. And then somebody starts getting off. Some preacher starts going down a, a path that's not right. You'll recognize. You'll say, whoa, whoa, now, whoa. Now I can't be right because this scripture says this. Right? And, uh, you know, every prophecy, every prayer you hear somebody pray, every book. Just because somebody writes a book. And they have initials on into their name. Doesn't mean they know a thing. It may be a beautiful hardcover with, with, you know, all kind of accolades and recommendations in the front. And they may have six letters at the end of their name. And it may just be complete junk. Did you hear me? Just because it's in print doesn't mean it's true. Well, they're on TV. Doesn't make it true either. They've been in the ministry for 40 years. They can miss it. Right? Thank God for the Word. Thank God you have the Spirit inside you too. And so everything should, be, should line up for you to accept it. It should line up with the Word. And you should also have a witness in your own spirit about it. Right? In order for you to accept it and act on it and live by it, it must meet those criteria. Well, in Genesis 1, uh, 2, we see the Spirit of God moving on the face of the waters. And the Spirit of God still moves today. Now, in talking about this, I want us to begin to, to talk about particulars why the Spirit of God moves or does not. Why He moves more in some places than others. Are you interested in this? Yes. Do we have a part in this? Yes. Oh, we do. Such a part. Uh, there are some places the Spirit of God moves much more in much wider areas than in others. And uh, some people have just thought, well, the Spirit of God, when He gets ready to move, He'll move. As though we had nothing to do with it. But as you study the Scriptures, you'll see we have a lot to do with it. We can yield to the Spirit of God. We can cooperate with Him. Or the Bible talks about people who resisted the Holy Ghost. And he cautions us not to quench the Spirit, doesn't he? Resisting the Holy Ghost. You'll find that phrase more than one place. And then quenching the Spirit. Well, it it must be possible. He wouldn't caution us not to do it. Can you uh, shut down on what the Spirit of God wants to do in your own personal life, in a church? Can we fail to cooperate with him? And we can. And like I said, on this particular subject, people oftentimes get in the ditch on one side or the other. Either absolutely no moving of the Spirit, dry, just letter of the Word, or legalism. And then people who, not only does the Spirit of God move, but all kind of other spirits move too. 
You just got all kinds of stuff going on. And I know from whence I'm speaking. I've been in the middle of some of it. And in the early days of my ministry, uh, we had, uh, we used to do uh, Holy Ghost meetings. David Horton, uh, Doc and Jerry's son, they were here, uh, what, this past Sunday? And um, visiting with us. And uh, Patsy used to be Bearman, now Caminetti, and uh, David and Cherie and Phyllis and myself and Ray Jean Wilson and some different people. Uh, you know, when you're young, sometimes you don't have much sense. And uh, we would work all week. I'd speak sometimes 20 times a week. And like we didn't have nothing else to do, we'd hang a flight to L.A. And with the time change, you could get there in time to do a service. <laughs> And we'd rent, you know, uh, David did, and we were involved with him in renting. uh, We rented part of the L.A. Convention Center one time, different places. And we had some uh, some meetings, man. I mean, uh, one time our luggage didn't get there. And I was the only one who had a suit on because I'd been preaching that day. So I got nominated to speak. (laughs) Ray Gene Wilson was going to do special music. He was in red sweats. With red uh, tennis shoes. <laughs> Got to remember, we're in L.A. now. I don't think they even noticed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we had, we had some meetings, brother. And I mean, God moved. And we had some outstanding things happen. Miracles. But as we had different ones of these meetings, there were a few of them that got off, too. There was some, you know, and this is, this is one thing that makes some ministers kind of draw back from this because the Spirit of God gets to moving and there begins to be liberty, then a number of people who think that's their opportunity. And you got a lot of what I call mic grabbers. Anybody know what a mic grabber is? Somebody that come grab the mic. I got something, and I got to give it out, and I got to do it. And there were more than one time we lost the service. Somebody had something that they just felt like, you know, they're the prophet for the hour. And, uh, you know, real adamant and pushy. Did you hear that? Pushy. That's one way you can tell a wrong spirit. I will say that real slow. That's one way you can tell somebody that's not really operating by the Spirit of God, they're pushy. And uh, us being so young and immature, we, did, we, we just want God to move. <laughs> Whatever the Holy Ghost wants to do. And uh, it, that's a good attitude and it's a good heart, but we need to have some understanding. And we need to have some leadership, or else why things get off. And so uh, more than once, somebody grabbed the mic and took the service a wrong direction. And you could, you know, we, all of us could tell it. It just went, phew, just like the anointing just went to nothing. And they yelled and berated people or prophesied doom and gloom and all kind of stuff. And, and we weren't strong enough and didn't know enough to, to you know, in love, stop them. Because after all, it wasn't their meeting. Uh, there's a whole lot of people who don't have a ministry of their own and they want to use somebody else's. Are you with me now? Y'all going to help me with this tonight? Or? They don't want to submit to anybody and they've not been able to develop their own because of their attitude and their rebellion and their unteachableness. And so they want to, without doing the work themselves, they want to come in and ride on somebody else's name and use somebody else's resources and abilities. You see it all the time. And strong leaders won't let them do that. But at the same time, a a leader should not be so uh, intense that they quench and quench everything. Did you hear what I'm saying? So can you see there's, there's got to be some leading 
And there's got to be some openness, but there's got to be some strength and direction too. And that's why uh, so many churches don't get it right. They either one ditch or the other. Well, I don't want to be in either ditch. How about you? I would like the Lord to be pleased with this church. Right? I'd like the Holy Spirit to find us easy to work with and comfortable. But that the devil would not be able to move either. And just human flesh and pride would not be able to move either. How many understand some spirits need to be quenched? Not for God. You're quenching the spirit. You're quenching the spirit. Yeah, yours. The Holy Spirit does not need to be quenched. But any wrong spirit or just flesh should not be allowed to just take over. Uh, Some of the churches I've been to where we had the most freedom to move in the spirit and the manifestations of the spirit also you had some of the goofiest stuff happen there too. Because they're just open. (laughs) Whatever. Well, that openness that works with the Holy Ghost also makes them vulnerable to wrong stuff. How can you discern between what's right and what's wrong? Got to come right back. Right back to the Word. The Spirit is not first. The Word is first. You don't even know what is the Holy Spirit if you don't know the Word. Right? The Word is always first. Always. Always. Well, the Lord's been laying some Word foundation in us for three years now. But I don't believe we're supposed to be just a Word church. We're supposed to be a church of the Spirit also. Right? Right? Not just during service time, but all the time. When we're at home, when we're on the job, driving in our car, and not just, not any goofy stuff or flesh stuff. We want the real. The real. Said out loud, Lord, we're hungry. hungry. We desire desire the real move move of the true Holy Spirit. Spirit. Teach us. us. Help us. us. Guide us. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Okay. Let's begin then. What can we do? What is our part? Number one thing we'll begin talking about here is environment. Environment. The environment is the conditions one is immersed in. One is surrounded by. We are an environment, we talked about this last week, of uh, the atmosphere. If you aren't, now on this series in particular, if you, if you miss just one session, it could hinder your understanding of the next. So endeavor to catch up. You can download it off the internet. Uh, CDs are available. We talked about how that we are in an ocean of atmosphere. Move your hand through the air here. This is not nothing. This is 14.7 pounds per square inch on your skin and on everything in here of something. Right? People talk about that. Well, there's nothing. There's just, you know, thin air as though it's nothing. No, this is something. This is our environment. This is what we live in. Take a breath. That's not nothing that went into your lungs. It's something. And the scripture says that those that are born of the Spirit are like the wind. Right? You you feel the wind. You see the effects of the wind. You don't know where the wind came from. Somebody said, oh yeah, I did. It was a south wind. Well, when it hit your face, it was from coming from south. But where did it come from before there? You don't know. And it was heading north. <laughs> which, uh, which way? North. Well, no, maybe the, the second it left your nose, you thought it was going north. But you don't know what happened after that. Right. So you don't know where that came from. What is wind? It's atmosphere in motion. 
Well, the Spirit of God's like that. Amen. He's like the wind. He's like the, the atmosphere in motion. Go to Psalm 139. Let's remind ourselves of this. Psalm 139. Hallelujah. Psalm 139. And verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my down sitting and my uprising. You understand my thought afar off. You compass my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, you know it all together. You've beset me behind and before, and you laid your hand on me. Did you get that now? Say it out loud. He's behind me. He's in front of me. And he's got his hand on me. How can he do that? He's God. He said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. Can you figure all this out? No, you can't. You just have to accept it by faith. How can he be behind me and in front of me and got his hand on me now too? Well, you can't figure that out. Later on, maybe we will understand it. But you can believe it. Verse 7 where shall I go from what? Now he's asking a question. Where shall I go from your spirit? We're talking about the moving of the spirit. Where shall I flee from your presence? You see, he uses these terms almost interchangeably. The spirit of God is the spirit of his presence. The Spirit of God, when we say, man, I sense the presence of God, you sense the Spirit of God, right? Man, I sense the power of God, you sense the Spirit of God. And I said, we, we were in the, the glory of God, you were in the Spirit of God. And he said, where can I go from your Spirit? In other words, to get away from your spirit, I wouldn't be around your spirit anymore. What's the answer? Hmm? Well, it, isn't it similar to said, where can I go from air? <laughs> huh? Where can I, I can get away from air. Well, first of all, why would you want to get away from air? You need air. You got to have some air. And the same thing could be said, why would you want to get away from the Spirit of God? Well, people do. How many remember Jonah? God told him, go preach to Nineveh. Warn them. So naturally, what does he do? He buys him a ticket on a ship that was headed out of town. And the scripture said he fled from the presence of the Lord. He did what? He's, he's trying to do this first. He's trying to get away from the Spirit of God. How successful was he? Uh -uh. And you really see that in this, in this thing. He says, verse 8, if I ascend up into heaven, what? You're there. You're there. If, my, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. You're there. He's there? Yeah. Well, he's everywhere. Yeah. Now here is a, uh, we're beginning to get to something I'm, I'm building towards. Is he manifested the same in hell as in heaven? No. But is he there? Yeah. So here's what we begin to get into. Even though he is there, it can be like he's not as far as what we experience of him. He said... If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning. Now that's faster than a jet. That's as fast as the light, the morning, has to do with the dawning of the light. And if you're fast enough, you could follow the, uh, 
the, the dawn around the globe. The shuttle can do it. The space shuttle, they see the sun set <laughs> and go down. But even, they're, they're not, you know, because of the, the circuit, circular motion, they're not seeing it constantly. That'd be mighty fast. Anyway, he said, if I, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, what? Can you find a place where the Spirit of God is not there? He said, no, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. The hand of the Lord is another term for the Spirit of God. You read numerous places where it said the hand of the Lord came on so and so. It's talking about the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Even there, if I say surely the darkness will cover me, even the night shall be light about me. There is nowhere you can go on this planet and get away from the Holy Ghost. And you should not want to. You should not try. I mean, Jonah fled into the sea. God was there in the boat. And he got thrown in the sea there. And God was there with him in the whale's belly. The great fish, I should say. Belly. And it was a bad place. Can you imagine being inside the digestive system? You think fish smell bad in the market? How about being inside the fish? Jonah said, I am in the belly of hell. That's what he said. He felt like he was in hell. And it is a type of Jesus going to the heart of the earth. But even there, now that's a bad place, right? Even there, he called on God and God heard his prayer and that fish came and spewed him out on the beach and he was very much in mind of preaching now. <laughs> he had gotten ready. He didn't have his sermon before. But now he was ready to go. <laughs> Isn't it sad to be so hard-headed? Isn't it? So hard-headed. And yet so many are. Running from God. Running from the call on their life. Running from the presence of the Lord. Now see that... That, that, that's hand in hand because the more in the presence of God you get, the more aware you are of his plan for your life yeah. and whether you're doing it or whether you're not. Amen. And so that's why people who are running from God don't want to come to church. And they don't want to be in, in good strong services. And they don't want to be in good prayer meetings and they don't want to get in the Bible. Why? Because it becomes more intense. They're more aware of where they are with God and the plan of God that has not changed. I mean, he said something to them when they were 12 years old, and they'd been running from it for 20 years, but he's never changed. He'll still say the same thing he told you when, he was tw when you were 12. But if you're foolish, you'll run and run and run and mess up your life and hurt yourself and other people and just be miserable. Do your best to have fun, but can't. And... Uh, you cannot get away from me. You can go to the farthest corner of the earth and hide behind a rock and a bush and God will say, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> you, you can't get away from God, even if you go to hell. Yeah. Did you hear me? He's everywhere. But obviously the environment is of hell is far different than the environment or conditions in heaven. Yes. Right? Yeah. And there are places on this planet that are not as nice as in here tonight. That's right? right? That's right. I think sometimes we don't, you know, may not realize how, uh, uh, how blessed we are. Today is uh, our mystic day. And, uh, you know, in celebrating the the veterans and giving thanks, uh, our country, our, our guys that are fighting right now, sometimes people, they, they try to confuse all the issues. But these guys, people say, well, so-and-so lost their life you know, last week, and, and, and is it worth it? Well, who are they fighting? 
These guys that are that exploding these bombs, they're terrorists. They're the guys that attacked us over here. I mean, it's amazing why people don't see the simplicity of it. These are not people trying to defend their homeland from us. These are terrorists that crossing the borders, uh, yes, they're fighting the same people that, that attacked us on 9-11. Right? And they're fighting because what, what's these people's big issue? They hate us. They hate our religion. Did you hear me? This is not just about only maintaining our sovereignty and our freedom as a nation, but the, the freedom of the church. And it's a bigger issue than this. It's a battle of who is able to control the environment. Oh, can you see the spiritual environment? So, man, when you see it truthfully, these young men and young women and everybody that has paid prices uh, in, in previous conflicts, it affects the spiritual plan of God. It affects eternity. They ought to be honored. Did you hear me? Because it's not just something that affects this lifetime when I'm fighting for my family and for the American way. Okay, but it's even much bigger than that. I said it's much bigger than that. Because the demons that control the people in the dark places of the earth, they want to control us. They hate us. Not just the, one, the reason the people hate us is because the spirits hate us. And they're yielding to these wrong spirits. And they, these wrong spirits cannot operate freely here like they can there. Because not, not everywhere in this country, but a lot of places in this country, the Spirit of God can manifest. Oh, glory to God. And whether all our men and women in uniform know that, that's what they're fighting for. Maintaining our freedom, protecting us from our enemies, is allowing this environment where the Spirit of God to move, can move to remain intact and to actually increase in advance. Actually, there's been invasion into places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, and even Iran and other places, they're, they're believers. They're underground churches. There yeah. are places where the word's getting in. Because a lot of people have seen what they believed failed. Yes, it did not work. And so the Spirit of God is endeavoring to move where He can. And He's hovering over these dark, dark places. Yeah. And enough people will rise up and provide Him the environment to move. Yeah. No amount of darkness can keep Him out. Can you say amen? Yeah. We've got our spiritual part to do. And our troops on the ground are doing the natural part that has to be done too. Don't you thank God for them? Yeah. Oh, thank God. thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God for natural troops and spiritual troops. Amen. And for the advancement. Of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the, the area of dominion where the king has sway and influence and control. Say it out loud again environment. environment. So important. The environment either allows the Spirit of God to move freely or hinders the Spirit of God. Y'all believing with me now, right? Yes. Say it again environment. The, help me to get this out, Lord. The environment is affected by our words and by our thoughts. The environment in here, right now, there's a natural environment, but there's also a spiritual environment. And what spirit or spirits are able to manifest and influence our thoughts and our feelings and our lives are based on what environment we provide determines what spirit can manifest. We want an environment that demons cannot operate in. That wrong spirits just can't get a word out. They can't get anything done here. 
which is also the environment where the Spirit of God can speak freely and move freely and manifest Himself freely. Amen. Well, it may seem like we started on this a couple of weeks ago, but really we've started on it long before. Yeah. Because the environment the Spirit of God can move in is the environment of honoring Him. Showing respect for him. We talked about that for weeks. And it's the environment of faith. We've talked about that for weeks, right? And the environment of being led by the Spirit. We've talked about that for weeks. All this builds toward this. Say it out loud. Environment. 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 Now go with me, if you would, to 1 Samuel, the 10th chapter. 1 Samuel. Chapter 10. Mm -mm -mm. Let me endeavor to expound just a little bit more. You do understand there are some places in the world right now where it is against the law to uh, profess and teach or preach Christ publicly. Uh, there are places where I could get up on the street corner and start doing what I'm doing now and could possibly be dead yes, before the week's out or the day's out or thrown in jail for a long, long time. Well, in those same places, the Spirit of God is not in manifestation to very, to very much degree. He, is He there? Yes, sir. Yeah, He's there. But stepping off the plane... You wouldn't necessarily sense him. You might sense something else. You, would sense, you could sense fear and oppression and darkness. Why? Because other spirits are in manifestation. Why? Because people, now see, they, they can't do this. The devil is not all he cracked himself up to be. He can't just move into a place and take over. Oh, he'd love for you to believe that, but he can't. He has to get people that will yield to him and provide him the environment where he can manifest himself. It is a, the, an environment of hate, an environment of, of uh, fear, an environment of strife and pride. The things that are of the nature of the devil, the more of that you have, then the more he's able to manifest himself. More of it comes out. And you live in that kind of environment. But glory to God. Because of the freedoms the Lord has given us. And the protection that he's given us. Man, we can stand up and preach anything that the Lord puts on our heart. And raise our hands and pray loud. and Right? In so many places in the world, this would be a government-owned facility. You couldn't even own your own place. We'd have to get a permit to even come meet. They could tell us how many could come and how long you could go. This is our place. Yeah. Paid for. Amen. With money God brought in. Amen. We'd do anything he tells us to do. Amen. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah. You see why the devil hates this country. Yeah. He hates these freedoms. Why? Because it makes it hard for him to move. That's right. Amen. The devil and his you know, cohorts are not prevalent in this place. It's like they're behind a plate glass looking in. They want to say something. They want to do something, but tough. We give God all the glory. We give the devil no. If he's able to pull off something, we won't even tell it. So the environment is not right for him to manifest to the degree he wants to. And by the same token, the better the environment is for the Holy Spirit, the more he'll manifest himself in our midst. Amen. And this is something we can, uh, can work on. Let me, uh, let me go into this. Do you remember when uh, Jesus delivered the madman of Gadara. 
You remember how that happened, how that worked. You remember those spirits cried out, and don't send us away from here. Why would they care? Why don't send it? Why is here important? Don't, don't make us leave here. Anything, but don't make us leave here. We'll go inside pigs, but don't make us leave here. Why? Because it takes the enemy sometimes years, sometimes a whole lifetime, a whole generation to influence people to the place where he can yield himself more. Excuse me, he can manifest himself more. Where they'll yield more to him. He has to mold people's thinking. And get their thinking and their words and their lifestyle. And sometimes he's worked on a particular region. In getting people to think a certain way and live a certain way. For generation after generation. And so they don't want to leave there. Because it's like having to start over somewhere else. Training people to think so they can yield. Which shows if people don't think in line with them, they can't manifest themselves there. I, uh, I saw something, and the Lord taught me about it in my own family. My grandmother's in heaven now, and a, a wonderful woman of God. I mean, wonderful woman of God. But didn't know a lot of things about faith or her authority as a believer. This is a number of years ago. And had, she was in a terrible tornado one time that damaged the house. And afterwards just had an inordinate fear of bad weather. I mean, uh, you know, thunderstorm began to brew up. And of course, back years ago, you didn't have all the warning that you have now. But you begin to see something come up. Man, she's terrified. She's a, she's a godly woman. A woman loved God with all her heart. But she's terrified. And it's not just... Oh, there's bad weather. I mean, it's torment to her. You could see it on her face. It almost incapacitated her. Run, try to hide, try to do something, you know. And she, she dealt with this all the time I knew her. Didn't come up unless it's bad weather, but when it did, tormenting, debilitating fear. Well, she went home to be with the Lord. And there wasn't, I don't know, a few months after that, I was in doing something, and uh, there's some bad weather came up, and I was around my dad, and he started acting that way. I was shocked. He had never acted that way. I thought, what? Because, you know, he knew some things about the Word, too. And you could just tell all this fear just came on him, and this torment, and, the, and, and I prayed about it, and the Lord said, he is more like her than anybody else in the family. So he is the enemy's favorite pick. She's gone off the earth. So the spirits that used to influence her can't do it. So who are they going to look for? The people that's the most like her. Why? Because they're the easiest to work yeah. with. The ones that would think the most like her would be the, the most, the quicker to yield to that particular thing. Well, thank God he knew some things about the word and we, I did too. We jumped on that and put a stop to that. We resisted that. He overcame that. So I said, oh, that, that scares me, Brother Keith. Spirit's going around trying to jump on people. <laughs> you, you just say... They, they do. It's just a reality. They go around. Didn't the Bible say the devil goes about seeking whom he may devour? Well, how is he going to do it? By getting them to yield to him. And uh, he will look for people who are like. And that's where some of this uh, spiritism stuff comes in. People say, well, I know these, uh, uh, these psychics. They're for real because they knew some stuff that nobody could know. Well, that's what these spirits do. They hung around this person all their life. Sure, they're going to know some stuff about them. Did you hear me? And from generation to generation. But all you got to do is say, no, you don't. Not in my house, you don't. Get out of here. And they got to go look for somebody else. 
And it's sad that not everybody knows these things. If everybody on the planet resisted them, again, it'd be like they're behind a plate glass. Be like they didn't even exist. Because they can't manifest themselves. But I wanted to describe that to you to see how it takes, even with the enemy, it can take years and sometimes generations in a place to get people to think and talk and to provide in the, right, the way they want them to so that it provides the environment where they can manifest and move. By the same token, with the Spirit of God. Can you see this? It can, it can take years for people to learn how to think and learn how to talk and operate to yield to the Spirit of God. And what should be happening is that people are learning from previous generations instead of it being lost and people starting over from scratch. Right? Instead of us gaining ground and losing ground, we should be gaining, 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 gaining. And uh, the Holy Ghost found our dad good to work with. He finds us even easier. And he finds our grandson even better than that. Our granddaughter. You understand what I'm talking about? That's how it's supposed to be. Because, you know, the training and the development was not lost in the generation. It was passed on. Learning about God and about His Word and about the moving of the Spirit. Now, 1 Samuel 10, are you there? Man, the Lord's helping us, isn't He? I've been able to get into some things last couple of weeks I hadn't gotten into, and I don't know when. Glory. It's good, isn't it? Well, we need to know it. We need to know it. Why? Because we don't just come and talk about wisdom. We get wisdom. Right? We don't just come talk about being led by the Spirit. We are led by the Spirit. We don't just talk about offerings. We bring offerings. And we don't just talk about the move of the Spirit. We have the move, the moving of the Spirit in our homes. In our homes. In our cars. At our places of work, in our involvement, and in our church. Yes, 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 yes. But again, do you see, it's something you learn. You don't learn all about it in a day or two. And the problem we got is we got a whole lot of folk that their, their folks didn't even try to learn the moving of the Spirit. Right? No, they're folks before them. And so they're really starting from scratch. Even in midlife or older life. Oh, but God's the kind of God who can make up what the canker worm and the caterpillar got. He's a God who can make it up. And he has to because his time is short. Right? And you know, like it or not, we're what he's got to use. (laughs) It's us. (laughs) He likes us. And we can become much better to work with. 1 Corinthians 10. Yeah, Samuel is right. 1 Samuel 10. The Bible said in verse 1, Samuel took a vial of oil. Can y'all take some more? Good. Samuel took a vial of oil. What's oil a type of? Spirit, anointing. He poured it on his head. And he kissed him. Now this is Saul, the first king. And he said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you to be captain over his inheritance? He said, When you're departed from me today, you'll find two men by Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin. You'll say to them, the, they'll say to you, the asses which you went to seek are found. Your father's left care of them. Sorrows for you, says, what shall I do for my son? You'll go on forward from there, and you'll come to the plain of Tabor, and you'll meet three men going up to God, to Bethel, one carrying three kid that's goats, and another carrying three loaves of bread, another carrying a bottle of wine. They'll salute you and give you two loaves of bread which you receive of their hands. After that you shall come to the hill of God, where's the garrison of the Philistines. It'll come to pass when you come there to the city, you'll meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy 
And the Spirit of the Lord will come on you, and you shall prophesy with them, and you'll be turned into another man. This, he had never done this. Saul had probably hardly ever even thought about prophesying. This never happened to him. But he tells him, this is going to happen. Right away here. Verse 9. It was so that when he turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets, the people said one to another, what is this that's come to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Now from the way they said it, maybe he wasn't a very uh, sanctified young man, I don't know. (laughs) But they said it like, Saul, you got to be kidding. Of course, we know from some things that happened later on, uh, there was a lot of pride in his life that he didn't deal with. Well, that didn't just start the day after he got anointed. You know, people knew him before this. And they, when they thought Saul, they did not think spiritual. <laughs> and they did not think prophesying man of God. They did not. And that's why they said, is Saul? People came to town and said, man, did you hear Saul's prophesying with the prophets? People said, no. <laughs> no, you, no. Yeah, I saw it. You got to be kidding. Saul? Among the prophets. And one of the same place answered and said, well, who is their father? Who's their daddy? What does that mean? Everybody comes from somewhere. What kind of people does God use? There's nobody you know that is used of God in the earth today that didn't come through a mama and papa just like you. And no, there's no man used of God today that commands his britches to stand up in the corner and floats into them in the morning. He has to take a bath just like you. Tie his shoe just like you. Right? Came from somewhere. Didn't do everything right just like you. Made mistakes. Fail just like you. God uses people just like you. Come on now. Just like you and me. Say it out loud. God uses uses people people just like me. Just like me. me. See, if he's going to try to find somebody that had no flesh, where's he going to find them? (laughs) People that already know everything. No, no. People just like you. That's why they said, well, these prophets, who's their daddy? They came from somewhere. So it became a proverb, is Saul among the prophets? That, it became a national proverb because it was so unlikely that Saul would be a prophesying among the prophets. Do you see this? Now, this was not something he was accustomed to. But when did it happen? When did it happen? He met them, and they, they, they had the music going. Do you see this? And they were prophesying. He got in their environment. Do you see this? Where the Spirit of God was moving. And next thing you know, he jumps right in. He starts prophesying too. A carnal prideful young man who has no previous experience but he jumps right in because it's the climate it's the environment it just seems the thing to do oh can you see this can you see this go on over just a few pages what is the 19th chapter, I believe it is, the ninth, 19th chapter. Well, no, uh, before we do that, well, 
No, that's good. 19. I'll just, I'll just tell you about it instead of turn there for time's sake. The 19th chapter. And verse 20. Now things have really changed at this point. David has now been anointed king in Saul's place because of his rebellion against God. And so the Spirit of God has left Saul. And there's an evil spirit now that torments Saul. And Saul has become full of fear and a murderer. And he's trying to kill David. Do you remember this? I mean, more than one time he threw a spear at him, tried to kill him. Now David has fled from his home and even outside the country at times. And Saul has sent of his army and his special elite teams to search and destroy David and his bunch. And so he sent, in verse 20, that's what's going on. Uh, Verse 19 Well, verse 18, David fled and escaped. This is 1 Samuel 19, 18. And came to Samuel to Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Nioth. So Samuel is the prophet, you remember? The one who prophesied to Saul to start with. The one who told him, when you meet these prophets, this is going to come on you. You're going to prophesy. You're going to be changed. So David is hooked up with Samuel. And they go... uh, To Naoth in Ramah, where was the school of the prophets. And this was, how many understand, this is a Holy Ghost stronghold. (laughs) Devils don't like this place. Because they praise God all night and all day. And the word of God is read in faith. And there's prophesying and there's praise. This place, Ramah, at Naoth. And Saul sent messengers to take David. He found out he was there, so he sent some of his troops. And when they saw, these, now you understand, these are not preachers. These are rangers. These are, are seals. These are some of his, this is our elite extraction team to come get him out. These are fighting men. And they show up at the school there, the company of the prophets, and they're doing what? Prophesying, yielding to the Holy Ghost, and Samuel is standing as what? Appointed what? Over them. So there was somebody directing these services, wasn't it? The man with the most experience and the man with the call in the place. It wasn't just a free for all. He was appointed over them. And he was telling folk, yeah, you go ahead. No, that's enough. Sit down. Yeah, that's this. Yeah, let's go this way. No, that's enough of that. Right? Can God cause our leaders to know enough about these things? To do this? Yes. And that's what what every church should be moving towards. And... The Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul. Who? Messengers means sent ones. The ones he sent to capture David. What happened? Spirit of God come on them. And these Marines started prophesying. The sergeant too, and the, cap, and, and, and the captain, the, the privates, started prophesying. <laughs> it's hard to, to bring up your weapon while you're prophesying. <laughs> it's hard to handcuff somebody. Yeah. Oh, can you see this? Yes. Man, what a, what a beautiful example of this. They might, you know, they came out from the presence of a man who sleeps with demons. So what kind of atmosphere do you think that uh, throne room is? 
They're, the whole bunch is full of fear and anxiety and darkness. And that's what they were sent out from. And they were sent out with, hey, don't you come back without his head. That's what they were sent out with. Yeah. So, man, they're charged. <laughs> they're trying to work their stuff up. Right? We don't care what's going on. We're going in there. We're taking him down. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> they were chanting to each other. And they were, you know, hitting each other in the chest. Going, we're going to do it. And as they got close, they heard the music. He looked at each other and said, stay focused, stay focused now. We got a job to do. <laughs> the music got stronger. Now here's another thing. Do you hear music? We see this again and again. Music, I should say proper music, helps to affect and influence the environment. Can you say amen? Good or bad? The devil loves some of these uh, concerts that people go to. You can, you can see how much people are yielding the wrong spirits by how things go when it gets to the place where it, it's chaotic and it breaks out and property is destroyed. Do you see this? And people are hurt. Well, that just shows you. Devils are in manifestation, man. People are yielding to them. There is killing and there is stealing and there's destroying. That's what's been going on in France. Did you hear me? People are yielding. These spirits, they want to do that every day and night. But they have to work with people and work them up to get them to the place where they'll yield to them and give them the environment where they can move. Well, the Holy Ghost wants to do things. Day and night. Good things. Light things. Saving, healing, delivering, helping. Oh, reveal joy and peace. But people have to cooperate with him. Instead of quenching him, shutting him down, got to cooperate, yield, provide the environment. Well, man needs some of his elite team that was sent to take David down. They hear this music. Next thing you know, they're patting their foot. <laughs> team leader says, focus, soldier. Yes, sir. We're going in. We're taking him down. Yes, sir. They get in there and they start prophesying. <laughs> the prophets are prophesying. Samuel is, is directing the thing under God. And this is coming out. And that's coming out. And you can sense the presence of God in that place. Man, the anointing is just saturating that place. It's wall to wall presence of God in there. And these guys, I mean, they might be hardened soldiers, but they are also Jews. They're descendants of Abraham. They know the covenant. They know the promises. They believe in God. And this is just too real. <laughs> and they know David's been anointed. And this is just too real. And while they're standing there and their hardness is melting and they're beginning to show respect and reverence to the older man of God, Samuel, and to these others that are ministering and flowing. And they took off their, hab, their, their hats and their caps and they laid their, their hardware down. And they begin to raise their hand. And the next thing you know, here they go. Out of their mouth comes prophecy. Can you see this? What is such a factor here? Environment. Now... They're, they're out of the devil's territory. They're in God's territory. God's got sway in this place. Oh, do you have a heart for that? For this place. Do you have every square? People just get close and begin to sense the presence of God. And people can't bring their devils on here. Their devils won't come on the parking lot. They have to stay out. The wrong stuff will just, even if people are being tormented and having trouble, when they come in here, they'll have peace while they're here. Because these spirits can't operate in here. Glory to God. 
Now, it's such a clear example of this. Do you remember back prior to this? What is it, like the 16th chapter or so? I'm not finished with this, but to remind you, how David and Saul got acquainted was how God used David, you know, to bring Goliath down. And then uh, Saul is in such a, he's so far from God, he's so backslid and so messed up that now the anointing has left him and an evil spirit is troubling him and tormenting him. The implication is it's causing him problems both physically and emotionally and psychologically. And so some of his counsel, good counsel too, they said, let's find somebody that's anointed, that can play well on an instrument and come in and play, and, and we think you could get relief that way. That was some godly counsel, wasn't it? And who happens to be available that is anointed, David. And so David comes in. You remember what the scripture said? While David would play, Saul would get relief and he'd get refreshed. Yes. Oh, can you say amen? amen? And the evil spirit would leave him. Yes. Why? Because he couldn't stay in that presence. Couldn't stay in that anointing. See, that's why, you know, thank God for laying on of hands. Thank God for anointing with oil. Thank God for uh, a spirit being discerned and cast out. But that's not the only way you can get set free. You get in a place where the presence of God is strong enough, you can be healed and nobody touch you. No, nobody pray for you. You can, you can be delivered and nobody discern anything. It's just the anointing of God was so strong, that ugly stuff couldn't stay. Amen. It just had to leave, had to get out of you. Can you say amen? amen? That's what was happening with Paul. When the Bible said from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons. And when they came in contact with the sick or the oppressed, the evil spirits went out of them and the diseases left them. Why? The anointing is the presence of God. When that anointing came in, devil stuff goes out. It's the law of displacement. Now can you see this? In 19, let me finish up with this. Saul sent these people. Verse 21, so what does he do? It was told Saul that your team you sent just went down there and prophesied and come back without David. <laughs> he said, give me some real men that know how to obey orders. And so they picked some tougher guys. And they sent them. Verse 21. And what happened? They prophesied likewise. likewise. <laughs> Don't you know these guys meant to do business? Yeah. The first team failed. Yeah. They probably laughed at them and said, you did what? I thought you were a soldier. I know it, but you weren't there. <laughs> you didn't bring, he was there? You saw him? Yeah, I saw him. <laughs> he was sitting up there with Samuel. He was within 20 feet of you, and you let him get away. He didn't even leave. <laughs> we left. You did what? After we prophesied. <laughs> you prophesied? <laughs> what am I running here? School of ministry? You're supposed to be the military. So he sent a second bunch, and they also prophesied. <laughs> and it's not over. And Saul sent messengers the third time. What happened to them? They prophesied too. I don't think they meant to prophesy when they left his prayer. But don't you think he gave them some, some words? He's a demon possessed man almost. I mean, we came down and probably threatened to kill him. Who knows? And so they got their intent on bringing him back. I'm talking about the third, te third team. Yeah. And as they get there, they hear the music. The toe tapping starts. <laughs> they go, no, 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 no. We're going to complete our mission. And they go in there, and the presence of God is so strong. And they see these guys prophesying. Not only did they not get him, they also prophesied. They began to do what they were doing. We're talking about the moving of the Spirit. Now, that's not the end. Keep reading. Verse 22, then went he, 
also to Ramah. He said, you're going to do something you got to write, you got to do it yourself, I guess. <laughs> so I'm sure he took his spear. And he goes himself, and I'm sure he thinks, I am not going to be swayed by this bunch. I am going down personally, and I'm going to take him after three of his teams have failed. He said, where's Samuel and David? They said, well, they're still right up there at Nioth at Ramah where they've been for the last three months. Right there, everybody knows they're there. Didn't three of your teams come down here already? <laughs> so he went there to Nioth and Ramah, and the Spirit of God was on him also. And he went on and prophesied till he came to Nioth in Ramah. Got on him before he got there. He is a, a cussing, hate-breathing, demon-oppressed specimen of a man. And before he even gets to the place, whew, glory, he came there to kill David. That's not kill David. Kill David, kill, no, prophesy. No, no, kill <laughs> David, no, prophesy. Prophesy, oh, glory to God. And he just started prophesying and, and listening to the music and prophesying and came right on in and stripped off his clothes. This would be his kingly garments, his authority denoting garb. He pulled it all off down to his basic underwear type stuff, I guess, and lay down in the floor. Prophesied. All that day and all that night. <laughs> David and Samuel sitting right up here on the platform. He, be, he, he think it's been his, life, his goal for the last several years to kill him. They've spent all kind of money. They've sent all kind of troops. There he is right there. <laughs> He's laying on the floor in his t-shirt. <laughs> Prophesying. He's a king. Not in here. No. No, that's our king, yeah. Not in here. There's a greater than he. Amen. And the presence of God was so strong that it was undeniable. And he lay down there, prophesied all day and all night. You thought our meetings went long. <laughs> Hallelujah. The environment of the praise of God, the reverence of God, the faith of God, the Word of God is the environment Amen. where the Spirit of God manifests Himself. And the more He trains people how to yield to Him and cooperate with Him, the stronger His presence gets and the effects of it reach out from that place further and further and further and the kingdom of God is obviously in manifestation. Yeah. Hallelujah. Because the king is in dominion and manifesting yeah. here. Yeah. Stand up on your feet, please. Glory to God. Glory to God.